Hello and welcome all to this roundtable discussion on art song organizations. Um, my name is Martha Guth. I am a soprano and then I am uh, both on the faculty and the artistic administrative team at Songfest. I teach at Ithaca College uh, and newly at the Collaborative Piano Institute at their vocal academy. And I also co-founded Sparks and Wiry Cries. That's an organization that is interested in the preservation and advancement of art song through performance and research and commission of new works. I have with me a very distinguished and celebrated group of panelists each um, with incredibly illustrious performing careers, and then each who have uh, been on faculty at dozens of institutions. Um, to introduce them all to you, I've tried to pull from some of those celebrated places so that you can get a, a kind of an idea of, of where they're all coming from. So in alphabetical order, uh, I'm going to start with uh, the wonderful Stephanie Blythe, who is the founding artistic director at the Fall Island Vocal Arts Seminar and uh, the director of the Vocal Arts Program at Bard College Conservatory. Um, Sholto Kaino, who is the artistic director uh, of Oxford Leader in the UK and uh, the pianist for the Phoenix Piano Trio. Kevin Murphy uh, is the di director of the program for singers at the Ravinia Steens Institute facul on faculty at Tanglewood, Indiana University and at Songfest. Um, and then Alan Smith, uh, who's on faculty at the University of Southern California Thornton School of Music. He's the music director at Fall Island, uh, coordinator for piano and vocal studies at Tanglewood and on faculty at Songfest. And then of course, the beloved Don Upshaw, um, head of the vocal arts program at Tanglewood um, and the founding artistic director of um, the vocal arts program at Bard. Hello to all of you. It's beautiful to see you. Hi. Hello. So there are a number of you, I'm going to jump right on in. There are a number of you who've actually begun festivals, educational institutions, um, performing organizations. I really wanted to ask those of you who have done that, what, um, what was the need that you saw at the time? What, what did you feel you were um, contributing to the genre, to the field at the time? Why, why did you do it? I think we can ask um, Stephanie Blythe, actually, right from the beginning for Fall Island. Okay. All right. Um, I started Fall Island actually with Alan. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, and, and Alan is actually the reason that Fall Island uh, happened, was because it was my work with him uh, as a student at Tanglewood uh, that made me want to be involved in song to begin with. So he inspired the whole thing from the beginning. Um, and also because we have this very intimate relationship uh, as collaborator and performer um, uh, and composer performer. So we have a very, um, we have a soul connection in that respect. And both of us uh, have been really uh, fed by song in our lives. And uh, I, I can speak for you in, in saying that now, I think. Um, one of the things that I saw a need for is I saw a need for a place that singers that are not necessarily um, young artists can come and study song. So we started our our age limit started uh, at, at 23, which is much higher than a lot of other places. And we we also there was a need I thought to look at American song in particular and new music uh, and text to help singers become better communicators and to be more um, autonomous in, in their art making and using song to do that, to become that, that conduit for that kind of music making and art making. And it just, we didn't originally start out to do only um, living composers. We originally started out as just American composers. After one season, we realized that there was a real need here, not only because 
it was important for singers and pianists to, uh, to study music in their own language and become better communicators that way, but also because there was a need to teach new repertoire. There was a need to put new rep out there. So not only, uh, I think that one of the things that's nice that's developed out of Fall Island is we also have this program where we work with professionals. So we have, we've had in the last three or four summers, we've had four or five professional artists, pianists and singers who have come and audited our classes for the week and also taken part in their own program, which is just keep, it just keeps developing into a bigger, bigger and bigger thing um, because it's a really important way to get the new repertoire out into the universities and conservatories. Um, and so I think that that's been, for me, that's been one of the most important things. It's just making this, um, is creating this new canon and, and being a vessel for that. Right, Alan, do you wanna add anything? Sure, to well, when, you know, I teach at a university and so at university, you singers and pianists learn to do everything. You learn to sing in every language, opera, art, song, uh, anything, early music, anything you can imagine. So to have a program, Fall Island is one week long. And so to have a small a program that is short in duration, that is very focused in its repertoire and very focused in its idea of helping young artists to be autonomous, then it really is a, a much different and needed focus than what a student might typically get in a wider spanning uh, university or conservatory training. So it's been very valuable in that aspect. Also, our uh, the development program for the professionals already has been very surprising, really surprised me about how people who are teachers at universities uh, want to come together and do that and be fed in that way. It's a way in which uh, art song is nurturing and it's a way in which coming together is nurturing. And so the power of that draw to Fall Island, which it, that, the, that professional development at first uh, was going to be a kind of a side thing and it's still uh, but now it has more of an equal footing i would say and it is wonderfully revelatory of the need that people feel well then you're creating a network aren't you of of pedagogues who can then go out and and um you know share the good news in a sense you know right yes. yeah yeah that's wonderful does anybody else wanted to um jump in here I'm happy to say a little bit about having started the Oxford Leader Festival, but um, I wish I sort of could say that I had some very clear vision when it started out, but actually I founded it nearly 20 years ago when I was still a student and for the first five years of its existence I was still studying, so the kind of urgent need for me was to perform at that moment and myself and a group of friends began this festival just because we wanted to put on some concerts um, and it was only then that it kind of sparked um, a realisation of the kind of compromised nature of art song uh, in today's world and, and how um, how rarefied it's become. And I think that was very evident right from the beginning with our, our sort of um, very small audience in that early, in those early stages who came forward and said, well, you're, you're the only people doing this. We can't, you know, there's a handful of song lovers here, but we can't get it anywhere. And, it, and the whole process over tw nearly 20 years now of Oxford Leader has been one for me of kind of learning what the need is and trying to respond to it and uh, and constant discovery in that sense and I think discovery of the need of the art form to have people promoting it and pushing it the need to explain to new people why it's important and vibrant uh, and then the need to keep nurturing young performers as I've fallen out of that category myself um, the need to look at schools and young people and say you know, why are you not taking music so seriously, particularly when it coincides with literature and can be so valuable to learning and, and life experience and, and so on and so forth, and really to kind of every category of of person and, and, and across the spectrum uh, to see what what need we can fulfill for, for people. So, so it's been a huge kind of learning curve for me and for everybody who's been involved with the festival. Um, but initially that need was really just uh, to answer your original question, what was the need? It was a kind of personal urge to just get out there and do something and be before my career had really begun. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on something you said. I mean, you you sort of described art song as sort of the compromised nature of art song. I found that really interesting, and I'd sort of love to, I don't know, delve into that a little bit deeper. It to sort of hear what you you all think about. Um, well, I don't know if it's audience development, um, audience engagement, and how we promote that, um, and how we use that web uh, in, in a certain way of maybe pedagogues, performers, uh, teachers, uh, uh, you know, scholars, researchers, anybody, administrators, to do that. Um, I find it's incredibly tricky. I think one of the best ways Sorry, not, not wanted to hold hold forth, but one of the, the, the advantages that song has is obviously being able to link uh, outside of music through the text. And that's certainly something that in Oxford we've developed a lot. I and mean, we're lucky to be in a university city where we can attach ourselves to other departments and institutions. And um, you know, when we when we look at settings of Hafez in 19th century Germany, we can actually take people and look at Persian manuscripts from the 13th century in the Ashmolean Museum and we can go into the Bodleian libraries and pull out manuscripts and um, we can talk about evolution and the great debate of 1860 and we can do it in the room where it happened where the debate happened in Oxford and we can talk about composers and poets and how they responded to arguments of science and religion and I, I think anything like that is a great advantage of song and I think when I said compromised I just meant that um, I think that's the kind of perception that's grown. There's no reason why fundamentally it should be. In fact, it should be the opposite. It should be the most accessible of art forms. But um, but it's just kind of, I think it's something to do with languages. People don't like um, the concept of having to listen to things in different languages a bit challenging. And there, it is a slightly strange experience. I think we can all take a step back and see that the idea of having someone singing to you very close up and very intimately about their sort of deepest emotions straight into your eyes is not something you experience every day. So once until you get used to it, it's quite a tricky thing. Um, but it has huge opportunities as well. Yeah, I would agree. Um, those of you who've, who've taken over the reins at different institutions, I'm sort of wondering, you know, when you came on board, um, what, what were the conversations that you were having right at the beginning of your tenure uh, at those places? Um, you know, were you, were you interested in really just sort of maintaining uh, what had been, you know, what, a beautiful uh, place of, of, of performance and, and dissemination? Um, or were you interested in moving the needle forward um, or differently in some way? Um, Dawn, I'm sort of, I'm yeah. wanting to look at you there. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Um, when I was asked to create a program at Bard College at their conservatory, the conservatory was brand new. And so there had been no uh, tradition there yet of how they were going to build their their music programs. Um, and I was actually first asked to create an undergrad program. And I, I, I realized that what I was most intrigued by was this age group and development, at least where singers are concerned. Um, that's kind of on the verge of becoming professional. So the, the, the master's age group was a little more intriguing to me. Uh, and I think what I, I wanted to ask myself what could have been um, improved upon in my own experience, um, how might I have responded differently to my own music making uh, in a different environment. And so my goal really was to create a program where every, everyone would uh, feel safe to investigate and explore uh, the medium to the repertoire certainly and to work on their skills of course, um, but uh, also to imagine the evolution of the art form and where it might go. And I, and only they can take it someplace new. I kind of felt like um, if I could try to create 
a safe and inspiring environment for um, not only delving into the material that existed, but to try to understand why they were even bothering to share these experiences with an audience and to interact with people this way in a concert, um, that that might be really interesting. Of course, that takes I, you know, a fair amount of time to uh, develop a, a program like that. Um, but I think we were, um, you know, the program got a good start uh, in helping the, the singers and the pianist to, to learn who they were kind of as, as performing artists and what it was that they wanted to do with that, what they wanted to say. Right, I think song actually is a, an amazing vehicle for that, for finding your own authenticity through music making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and what about it at Tanglewood um, for you and then for any of the, the, the many of you who, who are at Tanglewood or have been at Tanglewood? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start just by saying, of course, Tanglewood has a fabulous history, um, educational platform that um, has really done quite well for itself for a long time. So um, I think when I was asked to lead the program, what I what I what was very important to me was the spirit of collaboration and a very equal balance of um, singers to pianists and um, yeah that that meeting place and finding repertoire that would speak to these young musicians that um, were having a, a real effect on their colleagues and on their audiences, you know, in, in this journey of eight weeks. Right. At Tanglewood, there's a balance of uh, art song and opera and vocal chamber music experience. And so art song is one of a kind of three pronged thing that singers and pianists do while they're there. So they get a really immersive experience and the, the, they get to work with people like Dawn and Stephanie and get to uh, know these people whose expertise in all three of those areas is really, really keen. And so you get to, they get to work at the highest level with international um, stars in that repertoire who are also both uh, Stephanie and Dawn are people who are very nurturing as mentors. They're also very challenging as mentors. Not only do they create a safe space for students to do their best, but they challenge all these people to do their best. And I think that's really important. And arts, getting back to art song specifically, I think because song lasts, you know, from one minute to 12 minutes, it's a compact bit of information that you can really focus on and immerse yourself in and find out not only things about that poet and that composer, but as Dawn alluded to, so many things about yourself. And we can't be really great performers if we don't have the access of knowing what we offer to that moment, that alchemical moment where that poem, that music, that singer, and that pianist have never existed in the history of the universe before. And so it's a very special, precious, and very proud uh, thing to have created. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, Kevin, what about you at Ravinia or any of the multitude of places where you are? Well, Ravinia, I was really lucky that I inherited a program that had already um, gotten going in such a great way with Margot Garrett and then Brian Zieger. And um, I think this is my 10th year, the 10th summer doing it. And it, you know, it, I, I didn't have any ideas to change it necessarily. I think it's kind of evolved naturally. Um, certainly, it's important for us to um, commission new works and to try to find other repertoire that's not performed a lot. Um, I love that. It's also important for me to have this mixture of people. We have, in our, in our program, it lasts for three weeks, and we have 15 singers usually. And they come from both the United States and around the world. Um, always had a lot of Canadians and but people from everywhere. And I love to have a kind of a, and five pianists who are actually staff. So 
even, you know, a lot of the pianists are already professional and out working in the world. Some are just exiting school, but they certainly um, are having this kind of intimate relationship where they get to rehearse their repertoire together for three weeks and then uh, coach with great faculty and uh, then perform. But I love, I love the atmosphere where the singers and pianists can influence each other. Um, just, it's fun to hear people sing in their own language. Um, so I'm, for me, it's not as important exactly what the repertoire is every summer as much as it is that they're kind of getting things in a way that allows them to explore their own creativity, their own natural expression, and feel like they're in a place, like Dawn said, a safe place where th they don't have to think about opera auditions. They don't have to have, think about their five arias all the time. They can just kind of work on songs. And it, it's funny, three weeks, it it's it feels like three months really because each week is so packed and I think you feel kind of the opera shackles fall off after a couple of days and and they it's not that I, I love opera it's, it's not that opera is a problem but sometimes the pursuit and, and Stephanie and Don know, know about this I think that the, the things that you got to do when you're a young singer to get to perform opera and to, to, to get to perform classical vocal music is a lot and so to have an atmosphere where they can just kind of recharge and think of other repertoire that's what's really important to me so i feel very lucky at ravinia um, to have inherited such a great program that was already running and it's just for me it's a real thrill every summer something i look forward to right um i'm i'm sort of interested do, does it mean um when you're talking about discovering repertoire for all of these students, this is for anybody really, um, does it mean that you are trying to help people discover also their own identity, both as musicians, but also as an artist, in a sense? Do you feel like that comes into it? And, and I'm, um, I'm asking also specifically when it comes to sort of cultural, um, cultural explorations and things like that. I think has, it, that, has that changed anything in sorry has that changed anything in terms of where you're going um I think people well, everybody's different and some people think that a certain repertoire is going to be great for them then they realize that maybe something else leads them to find what they really wanted to do I mean a lot of people want to sing something very dramatic and something that comes naturally to them like let's say in their own language or a folk song they discount um and I feel um that process is so important to help singers find their equilibrium, you know, between their technique and their expression and to find this natural um, thing that exists. And having the, the luxury of time where there's no set um, deadlines, let's say, uh, say of maybe a couple of concerts, but really where you get to um, explore, I think it's, it's a unique way for uh, a singer to really find repertoire that suits them and shows who they are as an artist. I had the I think amazing... Having... Oh, sorry, Alan, go ahead. No, no, please. I had the amazing experience of teaching online my song interpretation course, which was completely online and will continue to be in the spring semester for us here at USC. Uh -huh. um, I asked um, my students if they had a particular um, language that they grew up with, a particular ethnicity, a particular culture, please to bring to the class at least one example of that repertoire in song that was so important to them. And I have to tell you the incredible explosion of joy and relief from them, but also what they, what that immersion into their own thought process, language, culture brought to the class. I personally will always do it in my teaching forever. I've always kind of done it, but I've made a real uh, push at it. And it was tremendously enlightening. I'll never forget um, a person who is Korean who brought a folk song about a mountain in North Korea that they all desire to go to return to. And she, uh, it was a pianist and she couldn't coordinate it with the singer. So she played it and she sang it herself. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely elevating to all of us. And then for her performance jury later, she coordinated 
um, remotely with a Korean singer in Berlin of all places. So we're coordinating between Los Angeles and Berlin, a singer who shared the same uh, joy and effervescence in sharing this repertoire from not only from their voice, not only from their diction, but from their soul. And it was tremendously expanding. I think what I, to, to, um, to what Kevin said about finding equilibrium, I think one of the other things that's, which is incredibly important, that's like, that's a, was a wonderful way of putting it. Um, one of the other things that I find fascinating about song is it requires a responsibility from young artists that they do not, um, it's a different kind of responsibility than preparing for opera completely different thing because opera is prescribed you know you're told what the character is yes you can do you can do uh, research and find backstory and do all of your do all of your due diligence to really climb into a character but it essentially it is prescribed and we are at we, we also are we can have opinions about what we want to do but the end <laughs> End result, of course, always is you're in a production, and it's a particular production. You're told what you're where, you're told where to move, and you are, and you keep an eye on the conductor, and you are, you are part of something that is extraordinary, no doubt. As a, but as a recitalist, there is a greater sense of responsibility toward um, choice, repertoire what you're saying, having some sort of, having some sort of reason behind what you're saying is, is incredibly important. And it develops a complete, it develops a different side of your, of your, of your performing personality than in anything else you do. And I think it's important also to recognize that the whole idea of recital has changed enormously over the years. You know, this idea of a solo artist getting up and there's a pianist somewhere behind and playing along, but you're there for the, you know, you're there for the singer, doesn't really exist anymore. That's sort of in the museum. Now it's much more, people are much more aware of this very intimate partnership. And it makes it so much more interesting to see two people working together in such an intimate way. And I think it's become, it's made the art form more desirable. At least, at least for me, it's it's lovely to see somebody do exhibition skating. I love that. You know, I love to see a singer get up and sing their party pieces. It's wonderful, but it's much more interesting to see and become part of this very intimate relationship. And um, we, it just asks something different of us to be more specific communicators. And when we become that specific, I mean, I, when I work with Alan, I'm never more aware of this than when I work with Alan, because this is what he's constantly asking for me as a partner, to be more specific, be more specific, to always have something motivated by something that's real. And I think that's why people who enjoy recital love it, because it does, it feels real. You know, you know when you know when you go to a restaurant and you're and you've just sat down and you're ready to order, and you're not sure what you want, and then you see a wait person bring a delicious dish to another table, and you're thinking, <laughs> oh, I wonder, I wonder what that is. I I I think I want that. I'm going to go ask that person what that is, or I'm going to ask the wait person what that is. Um, really wonderful performances, including art song, are like that when you observe what Stephanie was talking about between two artists, it makes me, and I think people in the audience want to go, I want to know what that is. I want to experience uh, what that is. Um, so I think that's a really huge part of it. Also, you know, uh, some recitalists, including Stephanie, now get the audience to sing at certain points. And I think audiences just absolutely love that we gave a, a whole performance during a blizzard at Carnegie Hall um, in which the audience was there and they were just raising their voices in joyful song and it was a it was a joyous experience and so to involve an audience not only as listeners but as participants in that way is a really wonderful 
thing. We don't learn to do that in university and conservatory recital settings. And I don't know that it is the exact place to learn to do that in every recital that we give at a university or conservatory. But I think it is an important skill to let students know is available. And let's say they do a run out concert to a church or to a school that that's a very important uh, part of doing knowing how to communicate and involve an audience. That's actually something we've been, been thinking about experimenting with getting the audience to sing in Oxford. They don't, the audience don't know that yet, but it is <laughs> maybe coming their way at some point. But um, it was interesting, it just, just made me think of um, one of our experiences this year. We had to put our festival completely online um, and we did 40 events in, in a week, all live. And one of the kind of, um, defining features of it for me right from the start of planning it was that we would try and get away from this thing that we've seen so many times of people standing on a concert platform looking down an empty hall pretending there's an audience there and sort of delivering this slightly uncomfortable feeling recital to an empty hall and I said right from the start what I wanted to do with the filming which didn't work for everybody but it by and large came off very well I think was to angle things such that the singer was just singing across the piano to the pianist and there was this wonderful sense of um, communication. And I think that sense um, that you were just talking about of being sort of observing something that's like a relationship between two people was actually I think sort of accentuated by that, that, that you could really see that. And it was like you were being invited into this inner sanctum. And I think that, you know, obviously it's not the same as a real performance, but I think that got a little closer to, the, to something special for people watching at home that you could sort of, you could feel, and I always feel that when you do part songs as well, if I ever, I'm lucky enough to work with a, a group of singers on some part songs, I'm always saying to them, don't, don't do your thing of singing out to the audience, sing to each other and to me, and the audience will feel pulled in and drawn in to, to and invited into your, your creative, creative process in something that's really special. It's funny, Sholto, because I just had this exact conversation with one of, one of my colleagues who was getting ready to record something and, and was feeling exactly that. I don't want to stare into a void. And I said, look, you're, you're married to your pianist. Why didn't you just look at him? I love watching the two of you rehearse. Why didn't you allow the audience to feel like they're sitting in on a rehearsal? You know, to see this kind of connection between the two of you, it's incredibly beautiful. And quite frankly, pretty sexy. I happen to think that that's a magnificent thing between pianists and singers. I always feel super sexy when I'm singing with Alan. <laughs> Thank you. Back at you. I, I, well, I, you know. uh, I remember years and years ago, I, I was asked to do a pre-concert talk uh, before a Schubert concert with Ian Bostridge. And as part of my pre-concert talk, we, uh, it, it was an all Schubert concert, I said that already, we all learned, me and the audience learned uh, on the music of Schubert. We sang it first in English, then we sang it secondly in German. And, and on the music was not on the program that Mr. Bostrich and Mr. Drake had programmed. But it was, I knew that it was going to be the first encore but the audience didn't know that and so the sense of recognition the yeah. sense of an aha moment when these two artists came out and sang this song that everyone in the audience had learned was remarkable there's another way to engage yeah. exactly it's it's the kind of thing that when i when i lived in germany for a few years um I could see all around me when you're talking about Schubert or, or, or Brahms or anything, you know? And so when in coming back uh, to the States or Canada, it's the kind of thing that I was really pursuing back home. This kind of like, how, how do we get that kind of recognition where it's so deep into the culture, it's so natural and right in front of you. That was sort of um, one of, one of our goals and my, my uh, co-director, Erica Switzer, that's something that she speaks about a lot as well. Um, yeah, that's been really important for us. Um, I'm, I'm interested also in learning about how programming for your own person, in your own personal um, performances has affected 
um, the administrative side or the hats that you wear and then vice versa. So like how those two things have influenced you all. Um, yeah, just the way that that's unfolded. I think when you know what it feels like to be on that stage creating, helping to create that moment, um, it really makes you a better, it makes me a better teacher, I'll speak personally, because I know what it feels like and I can pass it on to students. And then we, just explaining it can never be for a student what a student needs to understand it. The student has to do it to know uh, what that feels like, both how enriching it can be, how frightening it can be, how um, all of the things that we may plan uh, and practice to happen 100% may or may not happen and what do we do in those moments. And so it makes me a better teacher and a better uh, administrator. You know, we had a, a situation here this year in our online teaching of an undergraduate who normally would have been co uh, collaborating, an undergraduate pianist who would have been collaborating with singers and instrumentalists because of our online teaching situation was much more difficult. And so the student had asked, could they take a course that was something else not uh, collaborative related? And I said, absolutely, you can. But let me suggest this to you. They were going to do a, a course in pedagogy, solo piano pedagogy, which would have been incredibly valuable. I said, since this course that you're not able to access, access in the way that you normally would is related to collaboration, what would you think of doing a pedagogy related to collaboration. And so this is what the student will do uh, in the spring. So it was a creative way to, unfortunately the student won't be able to collaborate by playing as much with other people, but will be able to investigate the, rep the references that relate to that craft. So it, the whole semester then begins a kind of pulling back of a bow, of a bow and arrow that's what that is. And then after when students are let out into the world again, that arrow is ready to fly with more speed, with greater accuracy um, and things like that. So it's an, a direct answer to the question that you ask is how does performing, how did performing relate to being an administrator? And there's one uh, really, really clear example. I think for, for me, collaboration has always been the greatest joy and um, kind of revelation that comes from really having a strong partnership with somebody that you're, you're making music with and uh, the kind of conversation that, that can happen and what happens to the music making um, when you both come with a lot of knowledge and love and you know you've done all your research and all of that but you then are are in a conversation and you're listening to each other and uh, playing with each other you know there's a, a back and forth and um so i think that really had a strong impression on my administrative work in making sure that there were opportunities for building relationships and partnerships and encouraging um, students and trying to build curriculum um, to enhance that, you know, to give them the opportunity to not just feel like they're presenting something on their own, you know, but that they're engaged. And uh, it, I think is, well, at least for me, um, very, uh, very exhilarating and um, mind opening to, to allow someone else in while you're making music. So um, I think that's, that's the biggest way that has really kind of bled into my administrative work. In, in trying to create opportunities for young musicians. 
you see that that sort of that that partnership, that collaborative um, element that that is so unique and and beautiful and so on. Do you see that um, as a way for you to enhance your administrative um, work as well? So either whether it's reaching out to different partners and different organizations or reaching out to well, I guess I suppose teammates uh, or or mm -hmm. whoever you're working with. But um, is that also part of it? Definitely. Um, yeah. I think. Um, when the relationships are really strong, uh, well, it's just, it's heaven to be, you know, working in a situation uh, with someone who's, uh, you know, and you feel like you're on a, a team that's all, the team's working towards the same end. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Collaboration is a, a, musical collaboration is the very, basis of a kind of skill skill set of collaboration that everyone I think on this screen has as a skill set either um, learned in family or culture or developed over the years and it's incredibly important uh, we sometimes call it team playing which is a tired term but I think the same things that I want to be as a performer in terms of being fully informed myself of giving everything I can to the music while my partners do everything they can to give to the music and the joint uh, devotion that that creates is totally applicable to um, university and conservatory programs as well, that we're all there doing that same thing. Yeah, I think for me, one of the things that, that I think, I hope has main, remained an influence is that, that thing of having grown my festival while also Sort of becoming a fully fledged professional myself and so certainly the, we run a residential course for for a week i mean it was sadly postponed this year but um we have 18 students from around the world who come and live with us for a week and have a sort of very intense session a lot like a lot of what you you will do as well um and i the first of those that we did was really the first year that i hadn't gone on one myself and so when I was kind of thinking about how we would structure it and how we, you know, who we would book to come and do it, it was very clear in my mind what the, the good and bad things were of the various courses that I had been on. And I hope that I've remembered those and, and always kind of kept them very present, you know, just the kind of nurture that people need and the idea that um, it's not good enough just to lay on a couple of classes each day for people. You've got to give them a whole experience and you've got to let them sort of forget everything else for a while and, and just focus on this and make them feel like they don't have to worry about all that sort of daily stuff. Um, so I think we're very careful to do that. And then I think the other thing is also when we're auditioning people um, for that and for the Young Artists program that we run, um, to remember who you're doing it for and remain very focused on that. and and um, make sure that if you're asking people to come and audition for you, for example, we, we always, uh, if we want an in-person audition, we always pay travel costs for it. And we, we make sure we film it and we pr provide the footage afterwards. And we take photographs at the end, pub publicity photos for people. And try and make sure that even if you walk away without coming onto our Young Artists platform, you have a really valuable, good experience and it's public and it's, you don't get paid, but you don't, you don't up, out of pocket. And I, I, I worry about the idea of sort of, um, you know, making a hundred people out of pocket in order to benefit four people seems to me not a way to support young artists in a, as wide a way as you can. So those, those sort of lessons have, have remained at the kind of heart of our programming. That is brilliant. I feel yeah. like we all in the United States, we could definitely learn from that. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. That's great. There's other challenges, you know, it makes a rod for our own back as well, because obviously, everything that has to be fundraised for and, and, um, and it, there are other complexities as well, but, but I think it's worthwhile. Well, of course. With different models. I mean, I, I, Ravinia, we're lucky to have everybody fully funded as well, 15 singers, and they get um, videos of their performances HD, which is great. And I know it's hard. A lot of other programs struggle because there's just so many people that want to do it. And there's a lot of uh, overhead when they're a, a much bigger program, but, uh, the collaboration, piggybacking a little bit on what Alan said, in teaching collaboration, uh, especially from the pianist perspective, I, I think is so important. He runs a great program. We started one at the Jacobs School of Music not so long ago. And it's funny, but the things that I learned about collaborating, like when I was playing opera, for instance, and I would play for 
Don Upshaw singing Susanna at the Met or Stephanie singing, we did some programs together in the Young Artist Program. Um, I learned so much about collaboration there and in school by osmosis, but I didn't have so much training. And it's wonderful, all these programs that have really um, bloomed all over the country and really all over the world now um, to really teach pianists how to listen and to think. And, and those who aren't singer oriented naturally, let's say from the beginning, to see the light bulbs go off when uh, they've been used to playing with a violinist and all of a sudden they get hooked on the text and the singer. And I just had a former student who uh, texted me last night and she said, during, and she's uh, now in uh, Texas, she, and she, was, she never played for a singer until she came into our program. And she texted and said, I've been listening to operas and art song for the last um, three weeks of break and I just can't get enough. And thank you for exposing me to singer's repertoire. And uh, it's, you know, I think it's so unique, this marriage of text and singing and, and uh, music that doesn't exist anywhere else. And it's, it's a tough sell in a lot of places, as we know, and trying to keep it alive. But like everybody here, I think, has been kind of alluding to, when you are up close and, and near somebody who's doing it and who means it, even if you don't speak the language that somebody's singing in, you know when they're communicating in that language. And that becomes very interesting in and of itself. And now, of course, we have the technology to allow everybody to be able to access the text. And I know we're very thankful for Oxford Leader. I know all my students go onto that website all the time and, and look at the text. Mm -hmm. and yes, stories. thank you. <laughs> it's just terrific. So. You know, that, that brings me to the question when you're, you're talking about young artists. Um, for, for anybody who's sort of interested in starting their own uh, program or doing something like that to sort of take on that um, entrepreneurial uh, hat, where do you think the holes are now? Like what, what needs to be done in order to keep keep things moving forward to sort of like keep doors open to, you know, talk about, you know, I don't know, um, crossing over over lines in, in terms of, I don't know, genre or cultural divide or any anything like that. Where where is the need um, that we still have? We need money. Early on. Money is over, <laughs> but early on, education. I think people need to be exposed much much earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I, also I, the, I, what the what living in the pandemic has showed us is that we're not going to concert halls most of us to hear this music performed live. So we're engaging it all over the internet. We're engaging it electronically. This was true before the pandemic and will be just as true after the pandemic. And many younger people than I live much of their lives on electronic uh, devices, machines. And so I think this is a huge uh, way to engage students that each of us on this call have uh, electronic communications of what, it, what we do in our various festivals and that in some ways uh, is going to grab a lot of people but I love what Kevin just said about engaging them at younger and oh, younger yeah. levels you know we've been talking a lot of at my university about how to about community engagement especially young people elementary school age uh, during the pandemic but even before the pandemic and how we're going to double down on it after the pandemic opens again and the you know there are wonderful people who are experts at this engagement and who tell us that it's not just going to an elementary school and singing a Schubert song it's going to an elementary school and getting the students to sing something that they know and relate to and that they feel physically the joy of singing they feel emotionally the connection to singing and I so appreciate uh, Kevin's word about starting that at a really really early age i am in my career because i had elementary school music teachers i will mention her name jackie pride who oh. made me helped me love music and my first piano teacher mildred allen who helped me love music and that's where i was hooked at the ages of six seven eight nine and so look at me you know a few just a few years later and their enthusiasm <laughs> their love 
for what they did was what nabbed me early on. I think something that I feel in terms of going and working with younger people at that very early age, which I absolutely agree is so important, is um, to some degree not to worry so much about the kind of nurturing the next generation of performers. It's and in some ways not even the next generation of audience. It's just giving people that option at the start. You know, I mean, I think classical music generally has been one something that people they never get into it. I mean, very few people really get into it when they're really young and then it sort of grows on them. And then, I don't know, not that many people come to concerts in their thirties, probably when they're dealing with careers and families. And then it's, it's always going to be something that people come to a little bit later in life. And I think that's sort of fine, but not if you've not had the exposure early on, if it feels like a weird thing, because you've never experienced it when you were very young, then, then we'll lose that audience in, you know, have many years, it might even be decades, but but that's really worrying, I think. And um, the principle we've taken with schools work that we do, which we always do with very small numbers, rather than trying to kind of drop in and reach a thousand kids for half an hour each, we, we tend to work with, you know, just a few classes and then give them a really kind of in-depth project over what could be five weeks. In fact, this year we're trying to work, or well, the plan was to work with the whole school over two whole terms and 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 taking a lot more than that as well but it's all about sort of creative projects so it's about writing their own words writing their own music while also showing them a professional singer and pianist and getting them to sing and learn stuff and i think about sort of creativity and confidence and music making and you know some of them most of them won't end up listening to schubert leader for sure but some some of them might and definitely it will kind of enhance their general well-being and also their prospects of maybe later in life being one of our audience and certainly we won't appear kind of alien to them. One of the things that I've been discussing that, that really gets chatted about a lot in rooms like this right now is is uh, the role of the singer in the future post-pandemic what are we you know singer and the pianist and you know it's it's funny to say we need money um and it but that is what we need. We need money. And, and one of the things that, that singers have to learn how to do is to talk about what we do and why it's important and why people should be giving money to it. Because what, what, what has happened largely in the industry is that singers are taught to learn five arias, to get jobs, and then go where they're supposed to go and do their job and then wait for the next job. Well, that's not the way it is anymore. It's not going to be like that. It's, it's already started not being like that. Everybody, there, there are, there's a myriad of different ways to be a singing artist today. And one of the things that's important is that we all understand there's a responsibility to music making that goes beyond learning the notes. And those of us who have started programs and who are uh, and who are working on programs. This was not, you know, I wanted to start Fall Island. What's the first thing I had to do? I had to raise the money. You know, I had to raise thirty-five thousand dollars every for every summer. We didn't have an endowment, and so there, you know, you find ways to make it work so that you can make the music. But having learning how to do this is a very important part of being an artist now, being entrepreneurial. Is, is very, very important. Martha, you know this more than most, you know, because you're not just involved in Sparks and Wire Prize. Sparks and Wire Prize reaches out to other organizations and does a lot of crossover across the country and beyond. And they think that it's, it's important that, that singers understand and pianists, collaborative artists understand the totality of the art because when you have skin in the game, it becomes a completely different animal. When, it, when, it's, when it's more, when, when you are really passionate, I mean, having, starting a program, that's a passion project. You really gotta wanna do it in order to, and come on, Schulte, you, you, you've, had, you've had a program for a while now. You know, that's, um, that's fantastic. The, Tanglewood has been around for a long time. It's a passion project. It started out as somebody's baby and has been nurtured along over the years. Same thing with Ravinia. 
Song fest. Hopefully, it's, you know, song fest. Same thing. It's somebody's baby. Somebody had to, had got a bee in their bonnet about getting out there and doing something. And everyone is capable of doing that. Everyone. I, th I think, I mean, this is, this is a great place to kind of wrap things up because I think it's actually cyclical what you're saying, because this, this, this love of collaboration, this passion that we all have for the art form is exactly also the thing that should be raising the money when it comes to it, you know, because if you can speak passionately about, about need um, and education and uh, crossing divides um, or of, of any kind, you know, then, then you should be able to, and if you are a communicator because you are a musician and you are a storyteller, um, then you should be able to convince a donor, hopefully. <laughs> I guess the issue is getting in front of them and searching for them. Sure. And it's not just donors either, it's audience members. That's right. And the, you know? I mean, look at what Rosemary's done with Songfest. It's incredible. Absolutely. Because of her passion and she's brought us all together. I mean, she's just launched something from nothing and worked her tail off to get it to where it is. Right. And it's, it's because of her passion and her love for it. That's right. It's amazing. And Do the you... artists are part of what feeds it too. the art, the art that, that Rose, she is, she is, you know, in the, in the few, in the few online conversations we've had, it's very clear. It's the art and working in intimately with the artists that fuels all of that. It's really, it, it, collaboration is the number one word. Sorry, Shelter, I apologize. No, I was only going to ask whether in the US you feel you have the, the divide that I see here between the opera audience and the song audience. And it, it, in some ways, I think it's much harder to fundraise for, um, for song because the people tend to come to song because they're genuinely really into it and engaged, which makes them very, very supportive and very keen, enthusiastic. Mm -hmm but they don't necessarily have deep pockets and big checkbooks and mm. the people who maybe keep opera afloat and i, I don't um this is definitely very generalizing and and and, and um should you know speak carefully about it but um but it, there are often i think people uh, there, there's a different society around opera isn't there than there is around song and i think that is a challenge for song to overcome to sort of make people Think that it's something great to be involved with um, but I, I wonder whether you find that same sort of challenge in the U.S. that we do here. I think what we have to start doing in the U.S. is we, we have to do with 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 concert repertoire with recital repertoire what we've done with restaurants. We have to make it sexy like farm to table. Farm to table is made has, has is very specific it's boutique and and it everybody wants to be involved Everybody has become some sort of gastronomical success. We need to find that same kind of farm to table idea in song. So people understand it has that kind of, um, that boutique sexiness. I, I, it's just, you know, I'm, I hate to talk about it in marketing terms, but that's, but that's exactly what it is. You're speaking of a kind of terroir in a sense, right? Like a place, yeah. like the ownership of a place of a, of yeah. a you know, yeah. It's a flavor. Mm -hmm. I find it delicious myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful for all of you. Thank you so much for speaking with me today. This has been really wonderful. Thank you, Martha. Thanks, Martha. And everybody, I, it's great to hear um, all of you speak and hear the ideas. It's uh, inspiring. So. I'm grateful to you, Martha, for, for the invitation and so grateful to Rosemary Heiler for creating mm -hmm. this moment, that festival, and for bringing us all together with her passion and love. So much. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Martha. Great to see you all. Great to see you.